Are you ready to move into uh, our series on authority? If you said no, we're still moving into it, so get ready. <clears throat> I was just kind of inviting you into it, but um, yeah, this morning, in your bulletins, by the way, there's an outline if you'd like to follow along with me. Uh, I, I made a mistake in the, um, it says text Colossians 1, 15 through 17. That's true, we're going to be reading that, but we're also going to be starting off, just so you know, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. So go ahead and turn there. <coughs> Colossians 2, verse 8. I want to talk to you today about reversing the curse. And, you know, I, I kind of titled it this way because when we're talking about authority, God says there's an authority I've given to you so that you can rule your world well instead of your world ruling you. But the problem is, is we got this backwards. And are you saying, Pastor, that there's a curse that came with it? Well, Yeah. Actually, it's the Word of God. Genesis says that, that when Adam decided to hand over authority to the enemy, there was a curse that came. Cursed is the ground that you work on. Cursed is uh, the woman who, as she goes into labor, cursed. It goes on. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So there is a curse. But the good news is, is God says, I've paved a way for your, uh, you and I to reverse that curse, to turn that around. So that's the good news. So as we get into talking about this, here's where the challenge gets in. We go, what's the bad news? There's a curse when you don't function the way God designed you under his authority. There's a blessing that comes when you operate under his authority. The challenge is bringing your butt under that authority. You know what I'm talking about? Making yourself, it's called discipline. Disciplining yourself for the purpose of godliness. It's about coming under his authority. So God has limited the involvement in human affairs. He says, I'll be limited in what, what, what I do. We've learned that. He said, but there's boundaries. The, the decisions of men, they can do what they want, and he would respond based on the decisions that man made, whether good or bad, up or down, left or right. So God created Adam, and he said, let him rule. He created a garden, and he said, this garden's going to be a place called Eden, and this is your garden. Cultivate it, keep the enemy out, keep the snake out, right? We learned that you guys, myself, we have a garden. We are to cultivate it, and we're to keep the enemy out. How are you doing at that? Don't raise your hand or anything, just... How are you doing? Kind of a self-check. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, as you find out. And he says, here's your garden. Now cultivate it and keep it. <clears throat> Adam was to use his creativity given by God to cultivate it, but in order to do that, he had to keep the enemy out. Now, when we talk about what it means to understand authority and reversing the curse, I want to read to you from Colossians chapter 2. And this morning, before I get into it, did everyone get one of these? Yeah, if you did not get one of these, just kind of raise your hand up. There's a couple people in the back. If you can help them get one, you got one. Okay, hold on to that. We're going to use it at the end of service, and it's also going to serve as an exercise in self-control for some of you guys because I know you want to pop it like crazy. Don't pop it. If you pop it, we will pull this service over. <laughs> Anybody need one? I got two here. All right. Hold on to that, and I'm, we're going we're gonna to look at that in just a moment. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Don't let anyone lead you astray with empty philosophy and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking, from the evil powers of this world, and not from Christ. Verse 9, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, For in Christ the fullness of God lives in a human body, and you are complete through your union in Christ. He is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but, but not by a physical procedure, it was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were, were baptized. That's why we do baptism. It's a, it's a bearing of the old and a raising up of the new. <clears throat> and with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised you from the dead. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins. Be, uh, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ and forgave all your sins. Aren't you thankful for that? He canceled the record that contained the charges against you and me. I'm thankful for that. He took it. He destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. Verse 15. In this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities, and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. You see, what happened in the garden, and we started in Genesis, and you're like, how did we end up in Colossians? Well, we're talking about authority, because in Genesis, Adam 
fumbled the ball, so to speak, handed over leadership, authority, rulership to the enemy. But yet, it, it, as we're going to see, there's a prophetic word that's given, and, and it, he addresses it in the New Testament and says, oh, it's an issue, issue of authority. It's an issue of authority. If you like football at all, if you're an NFL fan, college fan, if you like football, you know what fumbling is all about. It's when the player takes the ball, whether he be the quarterback, the running back, the wide receiver, and he has possession of the ball, but for some reason, whether because of the enemy that's coming opposing him, or whether just because, because he lost his footing, or whether because he gave up, and the ball becomes loose and comes out of his possession, what happens when one person fumbles the ball in a football game? Man, you've got 21 other players going for that ball. They're going to attack that thing. They want possession of it. You see, in the garden, Adam fumbled the ball. He had possession of the authority and the rulership that God gave him, but he fumbled the ball, and guess what? The enemy was there, bang, to snap it, snap it up, to take it and say, it is now mine. So Adam fumbled the ball. Uh, what caused the fumble was that he got out of alignment with God. Uh, he got out of alignment with, in his relationship with God. Eve got out of alignment with her relationship with Adam. And this opened the door for the devil to take over the garden and begin to rule their world. That's what he does to you and to me. So great was this fumble that the devil and his team took the ball, and they've been on offense ever since, and they're now calling the plays. Human race has been playing defense ever since. We've been playing defense, and God has not designed us to play defense. We are to be proactive in our walk and in our spirit, and we're not just sit back and say, man, I hope it all works out for the best. We're not to sit back and say, I don't want to pray in the spirit. I don't want to pray even in the English because it might stir something up, and if we just leave it alone, maybe everything will just, will just get by. I don't know about you, but I'm sick of just getting by and because usually what happens is it's about the time I think I got by, I find out now oh, the enemy knows what's going on. He's been waiting to knock me out. People say things like, I'm trying to stop the enemy. Uh, but if you're trying to stop the enemy, that means he has the ball. That means he has the ball. He's calling the plays. He's running the show. He's setting the agenda. Uh, and we're trying to stop him because he's on the offense and we're on the defense. He and his team are taking over, and Jesus even recognized it, even recognized it in the word of God by calling him the ruler of this world. He's the ruler of this world. You'll always be reacting to another ruler who is ruling your world. If somebody else is ruling your world, you will constantly be reacting to them. So sometimes all you have to do is look for the reactions you get out of yourself to see who it is who's ruling your world. It's by your response. You have to go very far. When Satan took over rule of the world because Adam handed it over to him, a curse came with it. A curse came with it. It said, cursed is your career, cursed is your relationship, cursed are your finances, cursed, uh, cursed are your children. Uh, pe people have been playing defense ever since trying to keep the devil from taking more territory over their world. But with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we now have the home field advantage because he's changed something. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about two words I'm going to throw out there a little bit called binding and loosing. Okay? Now, we're really going to talk about this next week. But in order to talk about this next week, I kind of want to set the stage today about binding and loosing because it'd be like saying, if you've never driven a car before, it would be like saying, I want you to drive the car. Well, I kind of need to teach you a little bit about the car so that you know how to drive the car. So we're going to learn a little bit about, about, about let me try this one more time. <laughs> Sometimes, man, when when the Holy Spirit gets speaking, your mouth's just trying to keep up with it. I want to talk to you about binding and loosing because have you ever read the scripture, that which is bound on earth? is bound in heaven. That which is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. And you went, okay, and you kept right, going, right on going. I did it for years because I thought binding and binding, you know, whenever I was bound up, that was never a pretty sight. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's about the only thing I could think of, you know, whatever is bound on earth, I'm like, dude, you know, it doesn't sound too comfortable in that whatever is loosed, I remember loose too. So I, <laughs> let's just go to the next verse and be done with this. But think about this. Have, have you noticed it said, whatever is Bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Why doesn't it read, whatever is bound in heaven is bound on earth? And whatever is loosed on heaven or in heaven is loosed on earth. Why doesn't it say it that way? Because, because that would be so much easier, wouldn't it? I mean, if God, God took responsibility for it, if God did it all, God took care of it, and then he just be my little genie in the bottle, sugar daddy type of thing, give me what I want, that's what we want, isn't it? But there's a reason he says, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Because he says, when I see you, you know, the battles you go through, 
what, let me ask it this way, what physical battle are you going through right now? Don't answer me, but you know, maybe, maybe you're having an argument with your spouse. Maybe you're fighting for control. Maybe it's a financial argument. Maybe it's a, a, a sexual one. Maybe there's an addiction. Maybe there's a, a, a habit. Maybe there's a temptation that you're struggling with and you don't know what to do. Okay, you get that physical battle right there. And, and it's the thing that you've been trying to address and fix and overcome and get the victory, but it never seems like you can. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, it's okay to say yes. We're on the same boat, okay? We're all in the same boat. That one thing that you can't seem to get victory over is a physical battle, and we keep addressing it with our physical strength, our physical means, our physical minds. The problem is, is that we'll never fix it. It's a spiritual thing. And many of us are trying to fix the physical with the physical, not realizing it's going to take the spiritual to fix the physical. If you address the physical with, am I, are we doing okay so far? It's kind of like Sister Susie sells seashells by the seashore here for a moment. If you address the physical with the physical, you're going to get exhausted, tired, frustrated, angry, worn out, burnout. Does that kind of define some of the things maybe you've gone through lately? Because you've been trying to do it on your own, and finally you say, God, will you please help me? And then he goes, it's about time. Why didn't you start there? Now, I don't say that sarcastically, or sarcastically like I do that and you don't. I say that because many times that's what I do. I, I do the same thing. This is a spiritual issue. And he says, when you understand what it means to bind something on earth, as soon as you move, bam, it'll be bound in heaven. But if you don't bind it on earth, why should I bind it in heaven? Opposite's true. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven the moment that you loose it on earth. So if you're struggling today, maybe you need to start binding your mind, your will, and your emotions to Christ instead of binding them to everything else that you've been binding them to. And maybe, just maybe, you say, how do I get rid of that addiction? How do I stop looking at pornography? How do I stop with these sexual sins? How do I stop with this addiction or this drug or this whatever it is? Maybe it could start with loosing, I loose that power that's been over of my life. You have the authority to do that. Did you know that? You don't sit back and wait and say, well, when God shows up and there's this grand finale and the pastor finally preaches a good enough message, I'll get enough goosebumps that maybe God will change my life. No, God will change your life when you start to move on earth, he moves in heaven. It's the way it works. But you have to have him in your heart. You have to be on, uh, in, in his, under his authority. You have to be under his authority, as we'll see in a moment. Okay, this sets the stage then for next week. I kind of started into that a little bit. It's hard not to want to go there. But next week, we're going to talk more about that. When this fumble in the Bible occurred, Adam, handing over that authority, God was handing out the curses uh, because Adam moved out from alignment with God. So God gave a, pro a prophetic word uh, uh, in Genesis 3.15. He said, there will be the seed of the woman, and the serpent will bruise the seed's heel, but the, uh, but the seed will crush the serpent's head. Do you remember that? That was a prophetic word that was taking place. Jesus says, you fumbled the ball, Adam, and you've turned the rule of the planet over to the evil one by moving out from underneath my alignment, but I've got some good news coming. He says, because the woman is going to have a child. She will have a child. The seed of the woman, it says. Normally you would, in the Bible, read about the seed of the man because that's where the seed comes from. But this is the seed of the woman because this baby was going to come through the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. So the seed of the woman would, have, it, it would, would heal the hurts. But the serpent, Satan, it says that he's going to bring the attack. But there's going to be the son that will overcome that and crush the head of the serpent. It's a prophetic word. Jesus Christ will crush the serpent's head, his headship, his authority, his rule. Headship is that. It's rule and authority, by the way. That's why we strive for power. That's why we want CEO behind our name. That's why we want senior. That's why we want uh, leader. That's why we want number one, CFO, things like that. Because a lot of times people get fighting for titles, missing the whole heart behind what God wants to do and what he's speaking. He says this. He said, I'm crushing that rulership, that leadership, and trying to develop that heart that, 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 that understands that it's about submitting to authority. Now, that's easy to tell somebody. It's harder to apply to ourselves. Would you agree with that? I, don't, I, I have an easier time telling you you need to submit to authority, and I have a harder time telling myself that I need to submit to the same authority I told you to submit to. <laughs> hey, that's harder. But God says he honors that. He honors that. Jesus Christ has done the work that needs to be done. His authoritative rule of the enemies, it says it's going to be negated. That's why in Colossians 2, verse 8, it says, no longer be controlled by the thinking of men. Don't be controlled by philosophy, it says, or human deception. 
Verse 9 says, in him dwells the fullness of God in bodily form. All that makes God God, in other words, or all that makes God God is in Christ, but it's in a human body. So, that's why he can be the son of God and be the son of man. That's why he can be thirsty, and in the very next verse, he can walk on water. Uh, that's why he can be hungry, and then he can multiply, multiply food, and that's why he can die, and then he can raise himself from the dead, because he's God-man, fully God and fully man. Sounds like a superhero, doesn't it? God-man. <laughs> you know, in Jesus Christ dwells the fullness of God in bodily form. Let me read to you Colossians 1, verse 15 through 17. Uh, it's up there on the, on the screen. You can follow along. It says, Christ, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms on this earth. He made the things we can see and things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. So, if you're falling apart this morning, maybe it's simply because you and the glue haven't hooked up yet. It says that he holds everything together. He sees it all. He knows it all. And he wants us to know that if we've come to Christ, you'll come to the one who has broken the head of the serpent. Jesus Christ is the new head of state. He's the final authority. He has the veto power. That's why in Colossians 2.12, he can say, you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life. Verses 14 and 15, it says that he canceled the record of the charges against you and I, nailed them to the cross. You see, Satan got whipped at Calvary. Do you understand that? If you really understood it, you, were, you would be jumping and shouting because he got whipped at Calvary, which means all authority was taken away from him. All the authority that you think he has over your life is only the authority he has because you gave it to him. Many times we say, oh, the enemy's doing a number on me. He's working on me. He's, he's whipping my butt. It's tough times. Pray for me. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, saying pray for me. But understand this. The only power the enemy has is the power that you give him. That's it. Why? Because at the cross tree of Calvary, God was not only nailed to a cross so he could be with him for an eternity, but he took the authority away, the rulership away from the enemy. He took it away. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. And he took that and he said, I have now have all authority, and he gives it to you and to me. You see, when Jesus died, you know what they did in the Roman days? When, when you were to die or to be executed, there normally was a good reason for it. Uh, you were a rapist, a murderer. You were a, a, a thief. You were a, I, I can't even think of any others, but, you know, bad things. And what they would do is, is they would make a charge against you, and they would put it up there. And they would, as you hung on a cross or a tree or a rope or whatever it is they did, one thing they did was they would put a certificate next to you that explains the crime that you committed. So people that walk by and see you there, they can be like, oh, that's what you did, huh? So you're a thief. So you're a murderer. So you're, you're, you're one of those, you know, you, you don't have something right up there. And they could see the record that was against them. But remember this, Jesus also had a record against him, a certificate. Do you remember it? King of the Jews, King of kings, Lord of lords. He placed himself above Caesar, and for that, they nailed him to a cross. But what happened on that cross that they didn't plan was, is that Jesus Christ canceled the certificates. You know, today, you may be walking around thinking, you know what, I know I got issues. I know, I know I've got this problem with this addiction or this temptation or this whatever it is. And we almost feel like we've got a certificate that's hanging right next to our face that reminds everybody of all the wrong that we've done. But on the cross tree of Calvary, God wiped away that certificate. He said, today, you don't have to walk with it or live with it anymore. The only reason we do is because we do. Many of us don't want to any longer, but we feel like we have to. Or we feel like we deserve, you know, I shouldn't be. No, God paid the price so that we could be set free from all of that. But the problem is, is we don't understand that the power the enemy has is only the power that we give him. You know, if, if somebody were to come and put a gun in your face, that's bad. It's a bad day. But if somebody comes and puts a gun in your face and it has no bullets in it, it's still a bad day, isn't it? Why? Because you don't know there's no bullets in the gun. You can't tell the difference. 
somebody puts a gun in your face and, 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 and it has bullets, that's not good. But if there's no bullets, you won't know any difference. You'll still function like there's bullets in the gun because you don't know that there's no bullets in the gun. So somebody can point a gun at you and say, I want you to give me all your money. Give me your car. Cluck like a chicken. Do whatever it is. And they will do it. Why? Because they think there's bullets in the gun. But if you ever found out that there was no bullets in that gun, if you knew for one minute, man, you would be free from that power that's trying to make you do something, he'd say, cluck like a chicken. And you say, you cluck like a chicken. Bap! And he'd hit him. Because you don't want to live under that authority. You don't want people telling you what to do. You know what the enemy does? He points a gun at you. But there's no bullets in the gun, folks. There's no bullets at all. So the worst thing he can do is say, I want you to quit worshiping. I want you to quit saying his name. I want you to look at that on the internet. I want you to drink it, smoke it, take it, whatever it is. And you say, I don't want to do that. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, click, 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 click. And that's all he can do. All he can do is click his gun at you because he has no power. But if we don't know that, we will function like he does. You know the enemy is empowered in our life only because we have empowered him. God already took care of it on the cross. He says, I won the game. I mean, I, I gave him the whole karate chop, everything. He's done. He goes, I, and I've given you the victory. But you keep telling him that he's greater than you. And you keep telling him that he's greater than possibly even me. And that's why you live a defeated life. That's why your world rules you and you don't rule your world. So we've got to stop empowering the enemy. How do we do that? How do we reverse the curse? I want to give you three things real quick. And, and understand this. Jesus Christ disarmed the enemy, right? Okay, he deactivated the power that he has. He ruined his headship. If you come to Jesus Christ, if you are here today, and you said, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, I repent, I turn to you, you now are operating under his authority, okay? You are aligned under the kingdom of God, and you can walk with this authority, and you can walk with this empowerment that he gives. But if you have not given Jesus your heart, if you think that you might have, but you're not quite sure, if you have given him uh, permission in your life, but you've walked away from that, I'm going to give you a challenge at the end of this service to get that right. Well, why would I want to do that? Because this authority only works under the headship of Jesus Christ. If you work out of the alignment underneath the headship of Jesus Christ, you got water guns. It, you're just going to annoy people. Annoy yourself. You've got no power. You've got no authority. And you've got no weapons. That only functions under the headship of Jesus Christ. Number one, how do we reverse this curse? Authority is the right to use the power that you possess. That's what authority is. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. <clears throat> the enemy, let, let me clarify this too. Jesus Christ has done what's needed to be done. So the enemy has lost his authority, but let me tell you something he has not lost. He has not lost his power, okay? So don't be so flippant to think, you know, enemy, he's just, you know, I can take him on, you know. You get, don't, don't, don't get cocky. He, he's still powerful. But it doesn't mean that he has authority. He is powerful more so now than he ever has been, but authority is a different thing. Authority is the right to use the power that you possess. So uh, the enemy, he has power, but no longer any authority. So in order for him to use his power, that is the enemy to use his power, he's got to get you and I from functioning under the authority of Christ. He's got to get us to move out from under that umbrella. He's got to get us to move out from under that kingdom thinking, that kingdom authority. Because once we do that, we will be open game for the enemy. He has no power over us, but as soon as we come out from under that authority and start entertaining his thoughts, we have now empowered the enemy. And we start saying, man, the enemy's whipping me. I can't do this. He's so great, and it's just, I'm, I'm so weak. Yeah, you are, because you're not under the authority of Christ. That's, the, that's what happens to me. Now, hear this. Many people think that to live the Christian life means you never make mistakes. Uh, to live the Christian life means you never misstep and come out from under that authority. And God's going to go, you moved out from under my leadership. So hey, he's, he's not going to do that. You're going to find times in your life, I will guarantee it, that you will make a decision that God would not have you make. And it will not, it, God doesn't necessarily kick you to the curb, kick you out of the garden right away. But he says, correct your heart. Repent. 
Come back under that leadership, that authority, that anointing, so that God can work through your life. But know that that authority, it's the right to use the power that you possess. It's only powerful when you're under his authority. Because it's his authority, not yours. Don't mistake that and think you've got great authority. Don't think that I have great authority. The only authority I have is the authority that he's going to give me and that his word of God says that I have. Okay? I can't walk over here and say, you know, in the name of Jesus, Kelly, you need to buy me a Porsche, you know, because God said it. That's under the authority of Christ. That'd be misusing and abusing the authority that God gave. And some of us know people who do that. Some of us maybe are, have been guilty of doing it. Authority is the right to use the power that you possess. Remember, if you possess it, you only possess it because God gave it to you. Jesus Christ deactivated his authority, the enemy's authority. He disarmed him. He whipped him, if you will. That's why the Bible says over and over and over again that Jesus is the head. Ephesians 1.22. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him the head over all things for the benefit of who? The church. He's the head over all things. 1 Corinthians 15, 27. Read it with me. Ready? Go. For the scripture says, God has put all things under his authority. Not some, not a little, not a few, not a shake here or a shake there. All authority has been given to him. Christ is the head of all things. And he's put all things in subjection under his feet. He has legal authority. Why does he need that? Why does he need legal authority in the spiritual realm? Because the spiritual realm is the thing that affects the physical realm. If you don't fix it up there, you can't fix it down here. It's not going to happen. You can go get all the help you want. You can go to a convention, you can go to a conference, you can go to a seminar, you can find some temporary reprieve, but until you deal with it here in your heart and in your soul, you're just going to keep trying to bandage the wound. Adam and Eve, they had a problem because the spiritual entered the garden. So if you don't bind and loose, if you don't bind and loose it, it won't be bound and loosed. Uh, if you don't bind and loose it here, it won't be bound and loosed there. So you've got to use the power that you possess. Quit sitting around saying, oh, the enemy's whipping my butt. Yeah, probably because you're out from under that authority and you keep feeding that. You're feeding the wrong thing. And we're going to understand more of the binding and loosing next week. But number two, we have to address the roots and quit playing with the fruits. We complain, some of us, I know not all of us, maybe just a few, but we complain that our situations, oh, they haven't changed. When we haven't addressed the cause, we haven't addressed the root. We keep playing with the fruit. Jesus Christ, you might say, hey, listen, he's now calling the shots, and I'm living down here, okay? I'm living down here on earth. I have career problems. I have financial problems. I have family problems. I'm not ruling my world. My world is ruling me, but yet you tell me that Jesus Christ is the head and Lord of lords. Uh, he's calling the shots now. I'm underneath his authority. Here's my question. What's wrong since I'm a Christian? What's wrong since... Since, since I'm, I'm, I'm living this way, but it seems like the world is ruling me. Well, look at this in Ephesians, or I mean, Colossians 2 that we read. Verse 10 said, in him we are filled. Verse 11 said, in him we are circumcised. Verse 12 says, in him we were baptized. Verse 12 also says, in him we were raised. In him, with him, in him, with him. You're going to find this theme throughout the Bible that is a theological statement about our union with Christ. How, how is this, how does this work? This morning I had a cup of coffee. Anyone have a cup of coffee this morning? How many people like black only, just black? Just leave it that way. Okay. How many of you like creamer only? Okay. Sugar only? A few. Cream and sugar? How about fancy pants that has nothing to do with coffee and everything to do with sugar? Also known as probably Starbucks. <laughs> When I had a cup of coffee this morning, I had a black cup of coffee that was steaming off the top. And I like cream in my coffee. And I like non-dairy cream. I like the powdered stuff. Uh, <laughs> if you knew what the creamer stuff did to me, you'd go powdered too. <laughs> you asked in a way, so. When I put the powdered, when I put the powder in my, or if it's liquid for you, when you put the creamer in the coffee, what happens? Well, what happens is the creamer kind of unites with the coffee, right? Do you have a cup of coffee and cream? Not really. 
you do, you do, don't get me wrong, you, you, have a, you have a cup that initially or technically has coffee and has cream in it, but can you separate the two once you put the two together? Have you ever put cream in your coffee and said, whew, that's a lot of cream, I'm going to suck some of that cream out there. It's just, there's no way to do that. I'm going to extract some of that because I put too much cream in there. You can't do it. Why? Because a union has occurred that is irreversible. A union has occurred in your cup of coffee that you cannot take back. And Christ says, that's the same kind of union you are to have with the Holy Spirit, with the very presence of God. You are to be a cup of coffee that says, I want as much cream as he'll give me, and I want it to be in unison with his Holy Spirit, never to separate ever again. That's the union that God is talking about. So what does that have to do with this whole in him, with him, in him, with him? Well, it's the union of Christ. Why is it that if I'm living my life as a Christian and I feel like I'm defeated, why is that happening? Maybe it's because this union that we're supposed to have is not functioning the way that he absolutely wants it to have. I'll tell you what I mean in a moment. Most of us, we understand what it means to love God and to walk with him and, and to work with him. But in Ephesians 2, 5 through 6, it says, when Christ died, we died with him, Right? When Christ arose, we arose with him. And when Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father, guess where we were seated? At the right hand of the Father with him. In other words, we were attached to Christ, and we were stirred up, and there is no separating that. And if we want what Christ has, then we have to function in union with Christ. When I took my cup of coffee, wherever the black coffee went, the creamer went with it. When I went upstairs with my black cup of coffee, the creamer went with it. The question is, is when Jesus Christ moves, are you moving with him wherever he goes? Or are you saying, I don't want to go there? That can't happen in a cup of coffee, but it seems to happen in the body of Christ too often. And then we start saying, why don't I have any authority? Because you forgot the cream. You forgot the cream. You know, what happens is this. Many times people will... We don't understand this, this shifting. Uh, dads that are here, you have daughters maybe that got married. Um, when they got married, there was a shift in the kingdom that took place. Maybe you didn't want it to take place. Maybe you're still fighting that shift that's taken place. I don't know. But when, you know, I'm not looking forward to the day too quickly. When my daughter comes and says, Dad, I'm so in love and I want to get married. Be like, go to your room. Who have you been playing with? <laughs> Stay away from them. That's what you want to do. But eventually there comes a day where a boy and a girl will find each other. And a union will take place. And when they say, I do, to one another, when they do that, a shift takes place. A shifting of the leadership and headship of a father goes over to now a husband. That's got to be hard at some point, on some level. A kingdom shift takes place. Two weeks later, though, let's say that that daughter comes back and says, Dad, I need $100. You know what Dad can do? He can say, go talk to your new headship. <laughs> you think I'm joking. <laughs> it's in here. Dad, I need $100. Go talk to the new headship of your home. But you're my dad. You're my father. You always would take care of me and give me the money in that. You know what dad can say? He can say, go ask your new headship to come and ask me for the $100. That's authority right there. That's understanding what authority is all about. Well, you're just being a jerk, and you're just being controlling, and you're just being, no, you're, you're operating in authority. There, there's there's a, a way this plays out. See, Satan is over here saying, ask me. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the $100. I'll give you whatever you want. But the problem is, is just like a dad who doesn't understand authority, and I'm not saying that there's any specific dad. I'm saying that when you don't function with authority, you enable that person to do things that God never wanted them to do. You enable them to function outside of authority. You don't want that for their life. You just want to show love, but maybe it doesn't come across in the right way. You have to let them function under that new authority. You see, the enemy, he wants to enable us so that we don't have to function under the authority of Christ. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. All right. So the reason we're not ruling our worlds well is because we keep shifting. Why is it that in my Christian life, I seem to have so many struggles? I would, I'd, I would submit that sometimes it could be because we've been kingdom hopping. 
What do you mean by that? Well, we've been called to live under the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, right? So we come to church on a Sunday, and we enjoy the service that we hear, and we come to church, and we're functioning underneath that kingdom. But when we leave, we go to our jobs. And when we go to our jobs, we operate under the kingdom of that job. And then when we go do our devotions, we operate under the kingdom of the devotions that we take. And then when we go hang out with our friends, we operate under the kingdom of the friendship that is taking place. We're flip-flopping kingdoms and wondering why the rule is not there. Uh, we, why can't I get over this hump? Why is the enemy still calling the shots? Why is he calling the shots in my life? It's because I'm giving him authority when we operate outside of that union of Christ. That's why it's happening. So the question is then, how is this supposed to work? Got your little green piece of thing here? Little bubble wrap, don't pop it. Don't pop it. Because God is teaching you patience, self-control. It's all fruit of the Spirit stuff. You know that, right? You guys are going to be so mad when I end the service and don't do anything with this, right? <laughs> Keep a hold of this a moment. Get it ready. How is this thing then supposed to work? Number three, is it up there? Go ahead and throw it up there. Place the enemy back where he belongs, under your feet. Under your feet. Romans 16.20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Not your hand, not your head, not your mouth, not your words, not your might, not your mind, your feet. God will crush the devil under where? Under your feet. I thought Satan was under Jesus' feet. I thought that's where he was. Well, he is. But guess what? My cup of coffee says that I'm in union with Christ. So if he's under Jesus' feet, guess who else's feet? He's underneath ours he's under our feet why because we're in union with christ well i don't think i'm in union with christ there's the problem that's why you're not functioning in authority that's why you're not ruling well fix that and get him back under your feet and you will begin to rule well it will change and it will shift but we have to do it god won't do it for us on the cross jesus defeated the devil legally but you and i must do it actually that means we must physically, act, act, actively do something because the law has been changed. It can now be activated on the cross, Jesus Christ. All authority that is ever, ever needed was given, but we must activate it under our feet. He put him, the enemy, under his feet, and he said, now you activate it. That's why God told Mary in the Bible. Do you remember? God, God would tell people to do some crazy things. Why would he do this? Lazarus was dead in the tomb. Two days, Jesus shows up. Do you think he was late? Like his watch stopped? Oh, crap, I'm sorry, I forgot all about Lazarus. How long has he been in there? Mary could be saying, where were you, Jesus? I, I called you last week. Where have you been? Do you think Jesus is like, I I'm so sorry, we had a, a, a 10 camel pile up on the interstate. And I, I tried to get here, but I tell you what, it was a mess. And I had to heal some camels and a few dryer, drivers. And, and, and it just took a while. No, that's not what happened. He was testing what Mary, how she would respond showed up and said, Mary, remove the stone. No, she could have fought. We mean remove the stone. I'm a girl. Go tell some guys to do it. We mean move. I, I can't move that thing. What? You should have been here two days anyway. And by the way, when I open that thing, it's going to stink. I just want you to know that because he's been dead two days. Where were you, Jesus? See, Jesus wasn't late, but Jesus understood that he wanted us to place the enemy back where he belongs under our feet. So he'll say things like, Mary, move the stone. Moses, hold up your rod. Israel, walk around the building seven times because it won't be activated until you and I act. That's when it takes place. I want victory in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, I give it to you now in the name of Jesus. And you go, good. No, act on it. Do something with it. Walk like you're in victory. Talk like you're in victory. You may say, but I don't really see the victory, all of it yet. That's okay because there's a lot of things I don't see, but I know his word says, I have. You know what? I have air in my lungs right now. I don't see it, but I thank God it's there. Because if it weren't there, I wouldn't be up here. I'd be laying down there. See, we can believe in some of these things, but we can't believe that by faith we can move mountains. And God says, I've given you all authority. He says, I've already passed the legal law. He's under your feet, but you must activate it in history. That's why I left you here. That's why we're here on earth is so that we can be his body. He can work through us, being the body of Christ, expressing in history what he's already done in eternity. That's what it's all about. You are to activate the victory. Let me, whew, we're running out of time. Let me jump to Joshua, and we're going to end with just a 
and then we'll move into communion. Because what we're talking about, what we experienced in worship this morning, what we're talking about right now, we're going to celebrate here in just a moment. We celebrate communion not because some good man died on a tree so that I could go to heaven. It's part of it. We died so that we can, or when he died, we do this so that we can celebrate him taking back that authority from the enemy and giving it back to us. That's why we do it. And Joshua, do you remember the story of Joshua when there were five kings that were giving the children of Israel a bad time? And they, they, they captured these kings. And these kings were in a cave. And they were waiting for Joshua. Joshua said, keep them in the cave until I get there. So Joshua shows up, Joshua 10, 22, right around that area. And, and the kings are uh, uh, they're there, and Joshua shows up. And in verse 22, he says, open the mouth of the cave and bring the five kings out to me. You remember this story? Here's what it says in verse 24 and 25. When they brought them out, Joshua told the commanders of his army, come and put your feet on the necks of the kings. And they did as they were told. Don't ever be afraid or discouraged, Joshua told his men. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord is going to do this to all of your enemies. What is the Lord going to do? Put the feet on the neck and give you the victory. Joshua is the head of men, is the head of the army, but says that even though that we whip them, even though I'm the king, I want you to put your feet on their necks so that you know that you can do this. And it's exactly what God is speaking to you today. Can God come and just take away that temptation? Yes, he can. But what he'd rather do is use your foot on the enemy's neck so that you can have the victory through the body of Christ. Maybe you're struggling and saying, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this marriage. You can have the victory if the both of you are willing to use the foot God gave you, put it on the neck of the enemy, and say, not my will, but yours be done. What does that mean? You may not like seeing what you have to see. You may not want to deal with some things that you have to deal with. But if you don't deal with them, you're not dealing with them simply because you don't want to. Not because God doesn't want to give you the victory. God wants to give you that. He's already given that. He says, if you function in that authority, you'll see things move. Do you have your thing ready? Okay, keep it ready. Don't, don't get too comfortable just yet. Don't pop it yet. You guys are like, I'm going right there. God wants you to be able to put your foot on, I don't know what that word was, your foot on the neck of the enemy. But if you and I don't actualize it, we're just going to live a life that's defeated. We're going to give up. We're going to surrender. We're going to jump from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom to kingdom, never understanding what it means to live in the kingdom of God. You're going to hear a preacher or the Word of God say that we're to live under the kingdom of God, and you're going to say, I've tried that already. No, you haven't. You've tried every other kingdom. And he says, you are to come into unison with the kingdom of God, and that one only. Put the enemy back under your feet. The worst thing you can do is to come out from under legitimate authority, because once you do that, you lose authority. You lose that. You lose the authority because you come out from under the umbrella, and the power of the enemy will come after you and I. Now, Jesus has already won for you and for me to rule our world. Does that mean that there won't be any problems? Absolutely not. What it means is that God, though we will face problems, will give us the victory. Let me end with this. Um, I, I've really gotten into NBA, and the finals are taking place. And we've got the Golden State Warriors going up against the Cleveland Cavaliers, okay? Now, I really don't care who wins. I've got my team that I kind of want to win, but uh, game one was going to take place, and I wanted to watch it. But my wife wanted to watch some girly thing, okay? <laughs> and I told her, I'm like, that's all right. It's all about you. I love you so much. You know, let's watch your show. What, what I didn't tell her is I'm DVRing the game so I can watch it when you go to bed. <laughs> Don't tell her. The thing is, is when I DVR a game to watch later, you know what happens more times than not is my phone will beep at me. And it will say, doo -doo -doo, and I'll think, oh, who's messaging me? And I'll see the end result of the game, the score, and I see who won. I'll go, oh, great. Now I don't get to see who, you know, who won. I don't get to be surprised because I saw the outcome of the game. But here's the interesting thing. I still watch the game. I still watch the game. Some people would ask me, like my wife, well, why do you watch the game if you already know who won the game? It's because I want to see how the game was played out. You know, how, you know what worked out by the score of the game. You know how it worked out by watching the game itself. 
You know what happened by the score. You know how it happened by the game. And when I watched that game, though my phone told me what the score was, I still watched the game. And here was the funny part, because I like watching this guy. His name's Stephen Curry. And when he plays, that dude can go, you know, two-thirds court, nothing but net kind of stuff. He's throwing these bombs up there. And I watched him. And as I watched the game, they were doing horrible. I mean, they stunk. They're lobbing up these shots. They might as well throw bricks of butter up there. They weren't doing any better. Um, And now normally this is what would happen. If I didn't know the score of the game, I'd be going, what are they doing? I mean, come on, get somebody else in the game. They're nervous. I know they're nervous, so that's got to be it. First time NBA Finals. Come on, you guys can do better. And I'm getting worked up. And they can't hear me at all, but I'm yelling at my TV set like they can. But you know what's interesting? When I knew the score of the game, I didn't do that. You want to know why? Because I knew the score of the game. All of a sudden, the team comes out, and they look like the Three Stooges running around, you know, dun, 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 dun. I'm like, what are they doing? But you know what? I said, I have no clue, but it's okay, because I know that they win. I know that, though, right now, they're 19 points behind. I know somehow, some way, they're going to come back, and they're going to win this game. So I don't have to stress. I don't have to yell. I don't have to worry. I can just sit back and enjoy the game, because at the end of the game, I know that they are going to win. You know, Jesus Christ says, I've given you all the victory and all the power. I defeated the enemy on the cross. I have paid the price so you don't have to pay it. The score of the game is you win. Now enjoy the game. Enjoy the game. (laughs) I want to ask this morning if you just bow your heads with me. And I just want to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit, not as if he's not here. He is. But in such a way that We just say, Lord, we want to just invite you in such a way that your kingdom come and your will be done. You know, this authority that we talk about can't be experienced if you're not living under authority. Many of us want to have authority but don't want to be under authority, but it's not until you come under authority do you really understand the power that's there. I want to simply ask you this morning, maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've not asked him into your heart then this is a perfect opportunity. Nobody here makes fun of anyone that says, yeah, I need Jesus. That's what we're here for. And so we can understand how to live life. Maybe you've lived, uh, walked with the Lord, but you found that you have walked away recently. Yeah, you know there's a God, but he's just some God out there. But now you want to know him in a personal way. Now you want to know him as a father who's there, who will empower you, protect you, provide for you, and be your all in all. If that's you and you're here today, I simply want to ask this, that you just raise your hand. Because if you don't have a relationship with him, this authority we talked about means nothing. The authority we've talked about happens for those who come under the authority of Jesus Christ. That means you have a relationship with him. Are you here today? And you want the authority, but what you now are realizing, that comes with a relationship with Jesus Christ. If that's you, just simply raise your hand. I might agree in prayer with you. I'm not going to embarrass you or point you out, but God just wants to bless you. I agree with you, my sister. God sees your hands. Today, you can walk in that freedom. You can walk in that authority. You are empowered, and God will walk with you. And if God is for you, who in the world can be against you? Nobody. Walk in that. Is there any of the hearts here today? I'll wait for just a moment. I agree with you. God sees your hand and your heart. He empowers you with an authority that comes from above. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to say, oh man, I thought I was all that. All of us think that. What God wants you to see is what he sees instead of just what you see. Receive that in your heart and your life today because as you receive him, you receive the authority that God gives. Is there any other hearts here today? Any other hearts here today? Wait for just a moment. I agree with you, little bud. I see your hand. As you raise your hand, Jesus says, I come into your heart. He loves you so much. Do you know that? Okay. If you ever do anything wrong, you know what Jesus says? Say, I'm sorry. And he forgives you. Isn't that cool? All right. You leave today knowing that Jesus is alive in your heart. Now, here's what I want you to do. There's one thing that's been tripping you up. Go ahead and just keep your eyes closed with me for just a moment because I want you to visualize this. What's that one thing? There's there's one thing, by the way. There's always something that's trying to trip us up. Maybe you're here today and you're struggling with alcoholism. Maybe you're here today and it's anger. Maybe maybe it's, I don't know, complaining, backbiting, gossip. It could be pornography. It could be it could be a, a hundred different things, but you know what it is. You know what that one thing is that keeps tripping you up, that one thing where you keep saying, I keep trying and trying, and you're addressing it in the physical, 
but it's time to address it in the spiritual. Because addressing it in the physical is not going to cut the mustard. What is that one thing? And I want you to take that thought, and I want you to let this piece of bubble wrap be representative of that. All right? And I want you to do this. Place it under your foot. Don't step on it yet, but place it under your foot. And I'm going to pray for you. And when we're done, we're going to be absolutely quiet, and we're all going to step on it together. And we're just going to hear throughout this room what God is going to do. Father, we receive that in the name of Jesus today. We know that greater is he that's within us than anything in this world. We know that all the victory, all the authority, and all the power belongs to you. But you give that to us as long as we function underneath your authority. So, Lord, help us to surrender our hearts. Help us to humble our hearts. Lord, where we're off track, will you bring us on course? And, Lord, those things that we struggle with, Lord, those things that have been tripping us up, those things that seem to be controlling our life, and we keep telling ourselves, I won't do it again, but then we find ourselves doing it. Lord, we don't want to stay stuck. You don't want us to stay stuck. So today, we take the enemy and we place that underneath of our feet. And in the name of Jesus, we declare that we are free indeed. By the power of Jesus Christ, we claim this in your name. Amen. Now here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, I want you to just hear it across the room. Ready? One, two, three. Step on. <laughs> Some of you. Some of you may need to take this deflated, defeated piece of nothing and stick it in your Bible to remind you that when you go to that place, you open it up and bam, I'm reminded that I've got it underneath my feet. I've got it underneath my feet.